very special guest, Erin Lefebvre, and she is a naturopathic herbalist, and and she just has amazing wealth of knowledge beyond tea, but more into herbal remedies, and that's what she does for her practice. So, Erin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's going to be fun to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into herbalism? Yeah, so I am um, a, a master herbalist and in the United States that can mean a wide variety of things, right? Because we don't have a, like a body that certifies them. But typically that means like 1700 hours of study under um, a teacher of sorts. Uh, under an herbalist, and there's certainly a few universities around in the United States that do that. But I also earned a bachelor's degree in environmental studies, geography with an emphasis in natural resource management to be exact, and then a master's degree in environmental studies, specifically looking in ethnobotany. Uh, so how I got into herbalism, I've always been interested in it since, since a young child, and I did a lot of self-study for a long time. And at the time that I was really interested in it, there really the internet really wasn't a boom. Like I remember life without the internet, right? So I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna, how I'm gonna study herbalism, and I don't even know if there are herbalists in the modern day world. So I just need to go to the university, start learning about environmentalism and things that I'm interested in 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 the environment. And as I did that, I also focused on plant studies as much as possible. So in geography, it was phytogeography, looking at plants. And then as a master's student, I was able to really design my curriculum. So I was doing a thesis on white cedar, on the um, looking at it in traditional ecological knowledge with the Ojibwe uh, Anishinaabe um, Indian tribe on Lukudere Reservation, and then the scientific um, historical view of it as well. So, and I studied with Gigi Staffney, a local herbalist in this Great Lakes area, because I'm in Wisconsin, um, and formalized my um, training with her, and I continue to do extra training even, even now. So that's me in a nutshell, really fast. Awesome, awesome. So what exactly now do you do specifically with all that wealth, knowledge, and expertise that you have, you know, experienced in your life? So I do herbal coaching, which basically means I help people like pinpoint some of the herbs that are going to help them with their wellness goals or some specific health um, issues that they have. And then my main focus right now is the Plant Priestess Circle, which is a membership group where we uh, learn about herbalism and nature-centered spirituality and priestessing, and we put them all together and do weekly lessons um, and solstice and equinox celebrations and all sorts of things like that. So uh, that's my main focus is the, the membership group and supporting all the people in there and also doing herbal coaching and podcasting and all sorts of, you know, free content to, to help people learn about herbalism. Yes, yes. And we have so many of our listeners who who listen to The Essence of Tea because they're interested in learning more about tea and health and wellness. Like everyone knows tea is like healthy for you, but like, how is it healthy for you? And what I specialize in is specifically the Camellia sinensis plant, the tea plant itself. I do have a background in sports medicine. I knew, I do know what some herbs do, but I don't specialize in herbs like you do where your, your education is so ingrained in all the diversity of different plants, especially with with working with indigenous people of the United States. So that's very, very fascinating. Some of the questions that we have, our listeners are very interested in learning about is, is how to use different herbs as medicine. And, and we were discussing this before the podcast, like, you know, there are so many ways that people don't realize the impact and the um, concentration of their herbs, like even drying the herbs, like how many herbs it takes and it shrinks down when you dry it to preserve it. But that also people don't realize that you don't have to have an herb that is dry. You can consume it fresh and that's really, really good for you. So could you speak on about the consumption of herbs and different ways herbs are consumed or dried. And, you know, it doesn't have to go super in depth, but, you know, for the time of the show, but, you know, could you elaborate on that? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we call these herbal applications, different ways to get the herbs into or onto or around our bodies. And the most common is a tisane, which most people you know, will say, oh, I want a cup of tea, but is it herbal tea or is it the, the tea as um, Jenny mentioned? I can't pronounce it as... Oh, tisane. It's tisane. It's a French word. <laughs> oh, well, the, the camellus, the camellia... I can't say that plant name. Oh, the Camellia sinensis. Yes, <laughs> yes that is considered tea um, for most people. And I say to Zane uh, for the, the herbal infusion. So herbal infusion, tea, to Zane, those are all um, kind of one in the same. But there's many ways to make it. So steeping times can vary to pull out different um, plant constituents to be used. Uh, so different parts of the plant need longer steeping times. So there's a wide variety of ways just to um, use the plants, the herbal material, uh, and, and the steeping times. So then, so that's water-based um, ways to get the, the herbs into our bodies. And then we have tinctures. And the basic... Um, the basic way tinctures are made is steeping them in usually some sort of alcohol for about four weeks. And it's a very concentrated dose of it. And it also preserves the plant material for a long period of time because we can't always be making teas everywhere we go. So little tincture bottles can be very um, efficient and effective to use in, in a pinch. So uh, alcohol is typically what's used for tinctures, but we also use vegetable glycerin and uh, some people will do vinegars uh, as well. So um, vinegars can be made for uh, culinary purposes too. So those are another way that people will get the herbal, herbal mixtures into their bodies. But it depends on like if you need a medicinal-like effect from the herbs, then we do something concentrated. And if we're just trying to get some health benefits from it, then we you know, use it in a, a lower dose and less concentrated. So those water-based, alcohol-based, vegetable, uh, vegetable glycerin, and vinegars are some of the ways that we can get those into our bodies. Wow, that's so fascinating because we have so many listeners who have different health situations. So they can't always consume alcohol. Like even, you know, when you think of vanilla extract, there's alcohol in it for like the body sensitivity or whatever they're going through. So it's so good to know that there are options and it's great for like storage and, and making, so how much do you consume actually like of a tincture or of, you know, one of these concentrates, how do you know if you're making it at home for yourself? Yeah. So, um, for like, for tea, for herbal teas and infusions, uh, we call it a beverage tea if you're just drinking it for pleasure and fun. And we call it a medicinal tea if you're drinking like three cups or more a day to really get a lot into us. And with tinctures, um, I don't have a bottle right next to me to show you, but the tinctures are usually, they can come in different size bottles, but we're talking about like 10 to 30 drops three times a day to get the effect that we want. And it depends on how big the person is and how you know, how acute the, the illness is. Sometimes when people are really sick, they're doing drops, uh, like five drops every half hour or an hour until symptoms subside. So that, you know, the concentration really um, depends on what's happening for the person. So when people make their own um, herbal uh, tinctures at home, they will get a wide variety of different strengths because some people are adding more, some people are adding less. But when you buy prepackaged tinctures from companies, they have a very specific amount that they're using so that you know exactly what kind of uh, effect that you're going to get each and every time. It's like if you popped an ibuprofen, you want to know that you know 200 milligrams for a certain body weight is going to do certain things. Um, so when you purchase them, uh, from companies, that's what happens. You have a specific ratio that's being used. But for people like me who do the folk method, we're just kind of eyeballing it sometimes like, oh, a third in the jar and then the rest is alcohol. Good enough. That's that's going to be give me some medicinal like effect. And then we kind of test it out, you know, like what's 10 drops um, every t twice a day going to feel like what's what's 30 drops going to do? So is there something that we should be aware of, of like too many or too much? Of something like when is that is there like an overdose of that or taking too many drops especially if you're new if you're new um, my motto is start low and go slow 
So if, um, if you're new to using tinctures, and one of the companies I really like, which is on your side of the United mm -hmm. States, is Herb Farm, spelled with a P-H, Herb Farm, and it's out of um, Oregon. And uh, they have the dosage on there for you based on the weight. So if you're a certain amount of weight, then you start at this dosage. And what I always tell people is start like really low, start at two drops a day uh, for three times a day and make sure there's no sort of um, weird side effects. You know, does your body going to react to it and give you a rash? It's just like trying new foods. If I go to another country or, um, you know, try a different kind of food here in, in that I've never tried, you know, sometimes I just try a couple bites first to make sure like, is my body going to be okay with this? Or if it's not, then I'll, I'll know based on, you know, what the skin does or what my stomach feels like. So that's how I uh, recommend um, people to do with tinctures is just start really low and go slowly, you know, maybe try just a dose a day uh, for a week. And then um, if that seems agreeable, then you can go more up to the suggested dosage. Awesome. Awesome. So one last question um, is one thing that maybe a lot of listeners are curious about because of it is 2020 <laughs> and, and people are still trying to be very conscientious, trying to keep themselves healthy, putting on their face masks, um, very conscious of their community and people around them. Is there any recommendations that you have for us? Um, for, for general health right now, any plant suggestions? Um, a lot of people, they might have family members who are immunocompromised. And so is there anything that they can do for themselves and for them? You know, it's like you're in the airplane and they say, put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you help your neighbor. <laughs> and so like, what can we do for ourselves and for our family members? Yeah, that's a really good point to just keep our immunity strong. So anything with high vitamin C in it, rose hips have really high vitamin C. Um, uh, citrus uh, plants will do that too. So citrus peels um, will have a lot of high vitamin C in it. And also, you know, the elderberry syrup, I know it's getting a lot of attention these days, but elderberry syrup is very um, good as an antiviral. And there are many other antiviral herbs out there. But um, if you're doing the teas um, just as like a beverage tea even, we're getting those antioxidants in us and all the healthy things that we need um, in, in our beverages as well as our food. But uh, anything with high vitamin C, elderberry syrup is really great. And then also I like, um, I like to do a tincture of astragalus. That one is good for kind of an overall helping stress response and keeping our immune system where it needs to be. Wow, lots of great information, Erin. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. How can people find out more about you and what you do? Well, I'm at fullcircleherbals.com. That's my website. And then I have a Facebook um, page, Full Circle Herbals, as well. So either, either of those places, you can find more information on how to contact me. And my email address is fullcircleherbals at gmail.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin LeFay, for joining us today. And if you're wanting to learn more about tea, check out our other episodes on our podcast. And we can't wait to see you again next time.